Welcome to this video on GraphQL. My name is Chris Noring. You can find me on Twitter on Chris underscore Noring. Let's first try to answer this question. What's in it for me? Why should I be learning GraphQL? Well, this is your computer landscape. You've got different services, different protocols. In this case, it speaks HTTP. You might have a different service that speaks MQ instead, and a third service that has maybe an Excel API. Point is, your data lives in many different services in many different databases, and it speaks different protocols. Now with GraphQL, you can be the front end of the back end and negotiate with all of those services for the data that the end user wants. And the only thing that you need to care about as a front end developer is knowing what protocol GraphQL speaks. You don't have to worry about Excel or MQ or HTTP or any such technology. Now with your app, you're going to be able to, of course, the first time around when you build this, you're going to spend a lot of time building the GraphQL layer. It's not going to take that long. But next time around, for your next app, you can just talk to your GraphQL layer. You don't have to care about the other services because you've got everything right there. So your app is going to be able to tell uh, the GraphQL layer, I want a little bit of everything. I want a few columns from the first service, some columns from the third service, and so on. And the GraphQL layer just says, happy days, I'm happy to provide. And of course, this means that you're going to save a bundle of time next time you build an app because your GraphQL layer is in place and that's all you need to care about. You're also going to have very happy end users because suddenly you're going to be able to content negotiate with the GraphQL layer and say, instead of those usual 40 columns or 20 columns that I get on my REST endpoint, I'm going to be able to tell you I only want two or three columns back. That's going to save me a ton of bandwidth. So why GraphQL again? You know where your data is because it lives in the GraphQL layer. You don't have to worry about different protocols as you build your next, uh, your, your second, your third, and your 10th app. It's gonna save you a ton of bandwidth because you're able to negotiate with the GraphQL layer exactly for the data you want. So all your future app development will be faster. Okay then, demo time. In our demo, we'll build a GraphQL API. And to do so, we're gonna need the first half of our API, which is a schema. Now the schema defines the public API, but also different custom types that we might need. Then we're going to build the second half of our API, which are resolvers. Resolvers are merely functions that talks to your data sources and is able to serve that data back to the user. Finally, we will test our API out. We can have a visual environment that we are able to query and we're able to investigate that everything is implemented as it should. So let's go. Okay then, we're inside of Visual Studio Code. We have opened up Terminal and we are ready to start working. Okay, we have no files here at all. So the first thing we're gonna do is to create an entry point and we do so with the following command. Now we have an app.js file. Next thing, we're gonna install a Node.js project because we're about to install some dependent libraries from npm. Now the command npm init minus y is gonna run the initialization process with some smart defaults. If you look here on the left, you can see that we got the package.json file, which we're going to need because that one is going to store references to the dependent libraries. Next up, we have the following command, npm install, GraphQL and Apollo server. Now GraphQL contains the engine for GraphQL, so it's able to parse and do a lot of other nice things. Apollo server contains a few helper things for us. For example, it allows us to define the schema in a language called JQL, which is GraphQL query language. And it also enables us to have a server that's up and running uh, on a certain port. So let's install those. Okay, then we have installed our libraries. Let's have a look at some basic code. Up here at the top, you can see that we are requiring the Apollo server. So we are effectively importing it. We have two different helper methods and, and classes that we're going to use. So JQL, we're going to use that one to construct a schema. And Apollo server is what we need to instantiate to get a server that's up and running on a certain port and the URL. We can see, also see that we define a variable here on line six called schema that invokes the JQL function. And as you can see, it's a multi-line string because it's using a double backtick. Next on line seven, you see that we are defining an object called resolvers. And inside of it, it has a property called query. Lastly, on row 13, you can see that we are instantiating our Apollo server and giving it two different properties, type definitions and resolvers. And we assign type definitions uh, with a variable schema. And resolvers simply gets the resolver object that we create on line seven. Next up, we're gonna define a schema that we can use. The most important property in a GraphQL schema is called query. Now query is the public API. Anything you want to query for needs to be in here. 
So let's add hello. So here we say that hello should have the return type of string. So the schema here is just a definition of what's possible to do. To actually make it do something, we need to go to our resolver object on line 11. Here we are adding the property hello under query, and as you can see, it perfectly matches what we wrote in the schema. Hello simply points to a function that when invoked is going to return with a string exactly like the schema said that it would do. Lastly, let's have a look at our server here again, and let's see if we can actually start this thing up. At this point, we have a server. We have a GraphQL server that we could use, but we can't really communicate with it. So how would we do that? Okay, then we have added a call here on line 22. We are calling server listen. And because it is a promise, we're calling then. What we are getting back in our function inside of the then is an object. So we're breaking out the URL and we are simply just logging out where this URL is. So next thing we want to do is to actually instantiate our Apollo server and just and just call listen, which will actually get the Apollo server exposed to a certain endpoint, a URL with a port. To start our server, we simply type node app.js, like we're used to with anything node.js. Okay then, let's try to start up our server. As you can see, it's saying it's running at localhost port 4000. So let's go to a browser and find our server instance. Okay, so we have opened up a browser. As you can see, we're running port 4000 and localhost. Here to the left, we have our uh, query field. And we can see that it's a query by us using the curly braces. Erase this and start from the beginning. Everything that we have defined inside of our schema will be discoverable. So we can just type H for hello and it auto-completes and we can select this. Now at this point, we can just run the query and we do so by pressing the play button. On our right, as you can see, we get a JSON response back with a data property and it matches the exact query that we asked for. So we asked for hello and we're getting hello colon world back. Okay then, we are back inside of VS Code and we want to support one more thing before we end this video. We want to support calling external endpoints. If you remember that graphic where we put GraphQL as the layer on top of all those services, that's exactly what we're doing when we're calling an external endpoint and we're making GraphQL serve that through its API. So we're gonna go to a place on the web called Swapi, the Star Wars API. Now Swapi is a free to use Star Wars API. If you're a big fan of Star Wars like me, you definitely wanna be using this as you do experiments and videos like this. Here we see that we have a base URL and we could be using that to query for certain things. So we're gonna be querying for planets. Running the request, we see that we get a, a JSON response and we also get this results property. Now we need to remember that if we call this API, we will get some kind of JSON response back and our result is gonna be contained within this results property. So that's all we need to remember when we now return back to VS Code. So back in VS Code, we're gonna create a helper method. Here we have authored a function called getPlanet. Now what getPlanet does on line seven is to go against this Swapi API and fetch whatever JSON response is coming back. And looking from the web page, that should be an array of planets. Next uh, thing we do on line eight is to call rest.json, which is gonna compile whatever response object that we got into pure JSON. If you remember the response, we weren't quite done there. We actually needed to dig out results because that one will contain the data we want. So that's the last thing we do, and then we return. Now we have added something to our schema in the form of a custom type called planet with a single property on it called name of return type string. Next, we are adding the uh, query type planets. So we will be able to query for planets and we're also saying that it should be an array of type planet. Next step is to add our a function to resolvers. And if you remember, we have already written that function. Okay, we need to do something before we continue. And that is to install a npm library that will give us the ability to fetch. Because we already typed that in code, so now we need the actual library. To get that, we call npm install node hyphen fetch and then save. Once we have that library, we can return to our code. Now we have added the uh, type here called planets inside of the query object. And as you can see, it's invoking the method that we typed before called get planets. This time around, we have the const fetch require node fetch. So we have the fetch capability. This means we are done coding and we can try to run our application again, and then we should go to our browser. Per usual, we type node app.js to start our application. Our application is started at uh, port 4000 at localhost. Let's try to query for planets. Because planets should be returning a array of type planet, that also means uh, with the contract that we have with GraphQL, we need to select a column 
as well. So from this array of planets, we select out name to be displayed. Well, that's the only column we have for now, but imagine that we have more than one column. We need to select those few columns that we want. This is the content negotiation part. Running this query means that it goes against the Swapia API. And as you can see, we have the ability to go against an external endpoint grab that data and just display it through our GraphQL API. Isn't that wonderful? That was the end of this video. In our next video, we'll show how to support nested queries, but also how to implement something called a mutation, which is when we want to change data.